recording started, so I think we can uh, start now with the with the first lecture by Nick. And uh, I think the plot uh, should be 20 minutes plus uh, questions, uh, discussions, uh, and then other 20 minutes and so on. There will be exercises, so you might think already uh, at the end of today, uh, to form uh, some uh, study groups, uh, four or five people of you, and then uh, uh, you can uh, go through these uh, applications uh, of uh, uh, the lectures material, and we can discuss then uh, your solutions uh, um, with me and uh, with Nick uh, later on. I leave to Nick uh, just to start. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much, Elena. Um, so hello everybody, let me put up my slides. So hopefully you can see my slides. Um, so yeah, hi, I'm Nick. Uh, I am a theoretical particle physicist for my sins. Um, and I've been interested in a number of things, but fundamentally strong forces. So those are particularly, you would might have heard of them in the nuclei of atoms. So down in the center of atoms, protons and neutrons are held together. They're ten, the nuclei is 10,000 times smaller than an atom. So there's a really strong force at work down in the middle of the atoms there. Um, and actually, as of yet, we don't really know how to calculate in that um, theory without you either using supercomputers or making some quite clunky approximations. And so we're trying to improve our understanding of those theories. Um, another aspect of this is the idea that beyond what we know now, there may be other particles. I mean, even in fact, any of the particles that we know may actually, when you go down to really small scales, be bound together, not, so they're not fundamental objects, but they're made of things. Um, and then there would need to be new strong forces that bound those particles together. Um, so one, one thing I've always been interested in is whether the Higgs boson, the particle we discovered in 2012, is a fundamental particle or whether it's made of things. So I, I play around with that. And there's also a, quite a connection to string theory. Um, so if you have two very strongly interacting particles and you pull them apart, you effectively get a string between them, sort of the energy which is trying to pull them back together. Um, and that's been developed over a number of years uh, and in some interesting ways. And basically it provides an alternative way of thinking about the strongly interacting material in the nucleus in terms of a fundamental theory where the basic objects are strings. All right, so I'm not gonna talk any much more about all of that, but that's sort of where I come from. Uh, uh, so Eleanor has asked me to introduce you to quantum mechanics. And immediately we stared at each other and said, well, what are we gonna do? We could just talk to you in a general way about how nice quantum mechanics is. But we decided that, you know, given how, what a bright bunch you are, we should actually try to teach you something. And that means we're going to try and get a little bit into the mathematical core of what these theories look like. And that actually means that for this first lecture, we're going to try and teach you some calculus, which is the, the theory of how things change that we use throughout the whole of physics. Now, the other challenge we have is that you are from a variety of year groups. Um, and you have a variety of backgrounds. So I'm gonna try and challenge all of you, um, but if you're in the younger year groups, you know, if you get the idea of what differentiation and integration are, and you can do the simple problems, then we're delighted and you'll be able to understand then what we do in the future lectures where we're really getting into quantum mechanics. On the other hand, for those of you who might have seen some of this before, hopefully we will throw up some new ideas about how it's involved in physics um, and some of the connections between different parts of physics and also within calculus. So that's the plan for today. Um, and as Eleanor said, what we're gonna do, so to try and not overload you, is I'm gonna sort of talk at you for about 20 minutes and then we're gonna take a break. And in that break, um, Eleanor and I are going to be around and you can ask us questions and there are also some problems that you can go and try out. Okay, so um, I have a web page, which is this one noted here. 
So www.southampton.ac.uk slash Tilda Evans slash Quantum School, where you can find copies of the talks I'm giving and also the problem sheet. So at some point today, you'll want to find that. Um, if that sounds too complicated to type out, you can just Google Nick Evans Quantum School, and that should take you to the right place as well. Um, so we don't need to do that uh, just yet, I don't think. Um, but we will head in that direction. Right, Eleanor, am I displaying things sensibly or can you all see these pictures of people down the right hand side? Oh, right. Um, can, can you see the pictures of people or just the PowerPoint slides? No, I, I see the picture of people, yes. Uh, so yeah, it's, okay. cutting, um, it's cutting a bit. Um, yeah, um, so I think I'm going to try and share in a more sensible fashion. Um, So just hang on in there. Uh, so let me just share the PowerPoint. Okay, um, does that work any better, Eleanor? Not really. Oh, um, let's see. see. Mm, okay, but uh, if uh, if you. Um, if you hide the thumbnail video just uh, on top, uh, you should, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, so I, I think that does it, doesn't it? Mm. Okay, brilliant. All right, so that's the plan. So let's just dive in there and you're expecting to hear about quantum mechanics and instead you're going to learn about calculus, the uh, great theory of, well, even Newton or Leibniz, depending on who you ask about it. Right, so I, I want to stress that the reason that we're going to do this with you is that calculus is the theory that underlies all of modern physics. And, and so, you know, you need to get it under your belt at some point, and, and this seems like a good opportunity to do it. And the reason for that is that the thing that really makes physics so powerful is our ability to describe change. So that just means things moving, things accelerating, um, you know, the, the number of COVID cases per day increasing and all of these sorts of things. And it's really physics is, is the subject which, which takes that challenge on. If you look at biology and chemistry, almost all of the time, they're just asking about static situations, what happens over large times, or if they do describe changes, they do it in a very qualitative way. Um, it's really physics that has traditionally had the mathematics of these changes. So, you know, it's, it's really important for, for everything that we're going to do. In particular, in quantum mechanics, we're going to talk about wave equations and waves. Waves are things that fluctuate in time and space. So we really need this technology. All right, so here is a plot of just a y versus x plane. And I've drawn some curve in it, which is red. And the point is that as you go along this curve, things are changing. Okay. In particular, the slope of this line is changing, which we call the gradient. So this is the first and simplest thing that you can do uh, in calculus, is to work out how the gradient of this line changes as you move along it. So we define this in a little way. So, you know, if you imagine zooming in on some tiny bit of this curve, then that curve will locally look flat. So that's what I'm drawing here. So if I just go in on this bit here, we can imagine that this green line here is all we see of the curve. It looks straight. We, when, if we backed off, we would start to see it was more curved. But if we're local to it, it looks straight. So now we can calculate the, the gradient, in other words, the change in the height, the change in y, divided by the change in x. So that's what you calculate if you want to work out if a hill you're going to climb is going to be hard work or not. OK, and the point is that by doing this zooming in on a point, I can do that at different places on the curve and I'll get a different answer at each place because the, the little line is, is slowly shifting round as you move round um, that, uh, that curve. OK, so the way that we say this 
mathematically is that we want to calculate the change in the height. So if we write this as a function f of x, which probably you've seen, but this is really just y. Okay, so I'm plotting here just y. So you can think of this, if you like, as almost dy by dx. Um, well, I've chosen to call it f here. Okay, so dfx is this change in the height as I go across this little bit here, and I'm going to call that change in x delta x. And that's because we're going to make it extremely small. In fact, this first thing here says I'm going to take the limit where delta x goes to zero. So that's just saying it's going to be a very, very small triangle that I work this out for, right at that black point there, for example. Okay, so what I do is I calculate the change in the height. So I, I work out the difference between the value of the function here, that's f at x. So if this is x, whoops, if this is the point x, then I go on delta x. So this is the value of the field at x plus delta x. And I take away from it the value of the function here, f of x. And that's the change in the height. And then I divide by the distance delta x that I've gone from x to calculate this change. So this is how we calculate this slope generally. And there are four examples of doing this that I want to talk you through. Um, because those are the ones that we're going to need in order to do things in quantum mechanics. And the first one is just a function which is x to some power n. So you can think of this as x squared or x cubed or whatever you fancy. But all we have to do is just use our formula up here um, to work out what we do. So we want to know what is the value of this function, a distance delta x away from some point x? So it's x to the n, so I do x plus delta x to the nth power. Now, I'm sure you're at least used to quadratics and, and, uh, and um, powers of three, um, but how does it go generally? Well, of course, when I start, if I if I did squared, I would do this times itself. I would get an x squared, and I would get a delta x squared, and then I get cross terms. I would get x times delta x, but then there's a second one of those where this delta x hits the x in the other bracket that I'm multiplying it by. So I get the coefficients one for the x squared, two for the x times delta x, and one for the delta x squared. Now, if I cube this, I multiply this together three times, I get one x cubed and one delta x cubed, but then I get three x squared times delta x and three delta x squared times x. And this is how it goes on. This is Pascal's triangle. You can see that you get each number below by adding the two guys above. So this is the line for quadratics, for cubics, to the fourth power, to the fifth power, to the sixth power, and to the seventh power. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to write down the first two terms. So the first term is gonna be where I take the x in all n of the things that I multiply together, and I get x to the n, and that's this one going down the side here for all values. And then I'm going to take the next biggest, so I'm assuming delta x is really small, right? So if delta x was, you know, a tenth, then delta x is a tenth, but delta x squared is a hundredth. So as I go along and get higher powers of delta x, I get smaller and smaller numbers. And I'm going to not worry about the very small one. In fact, it's going to be enough for me just to take the next one. So that's this line here. And what you'll notice here is that for quadratics, it's two, for cubes, it's three, for to the fourth power, it's four, to the fifth power, it's five. All right, we've got the pattern, right? This is just n, the power that I raise this to here. And then I get all of them being x's except one. So that's the x to the n minus one. And I get one delta x in the expression. 
So that's a pretty good approximation if delta x is small to what this function x to the n looks like. If I just go a little bit away by delta x. Okay, so now I can substitute that into this formula up here. So I get my x to the n plus n x to the n minus one delta x, and then I've dropped these other bits. And I take away from it my original function just evaluated at x, that's x to the n, and divide by the distance that I went along in x, which is delta x. All right, so the x to the n's cancel. That guy and that guy just cancel against each other. And I'm left with this divided by that. But I can divide the delta x top and bottom, and therefore I'm just left with n x to the n minus one. And this is how we write this general form of the gradient that we write as this derivative, the d by dx of x to the n is the notation that people use. So if you want to know the gradient where x equals zero, you just put x equals zero in here and the answer is zero. If you want to know when x is one, you put one in here and in that case, you'll just get the answer n and so on. All right, so that's the simplest one. Uh, and hopefully you got some of that. Um, the other functions I want to think about because we're gonna go on and do quantum mechanics and talk about waves, I'm gonna talk about cosine and sine waves and their derivatives. Okay, so I want to find out what basically the gradient is of cosine of x as I move along the, the curve. So again, I use my formula. I'm gonna do that tiny little triangle, this one down here, how much has the height changed? That's cos x plus delta x, the value here, minus cos of x, the value there, that's the change in the height, divided by the change in x, delta x. Right, now I have to do some more clever things. So one is that I have to use a trigonometric identity for this. And this is the one I'm gonna use. It's that cos A plus B is equal to the cosine of A, cosine of B minus sine A, sine B. Now, some of you will have seen that and some of you won't, and I'm not gonna prove it for you um, today, but if you want, you can just Google trigonometric identities and you'll find proofs of this. Uh, and you can just do them by drawing a mixture of squares and triangles and doing some clever um, things to show that this is the case. All right, so I'm then gonna use that on this because it's cos of one thing plus another thing. So I can just do this. And I get cos x, cos delta x, minus sine x, sine delta x. And this, then this minus cos x goes along for the ride and this delta x goes along for the ride. Right, now I'm gonna use the fact that delta x is small. So let me just go on to the next slide and show you, here's what sine looks like. So don't worry about these pies at the moment. So, so as you probably were first taught this, you go to 90 degrees and sine goes from zero to one. Cosine is the same thing, but shifted. It starts at one at zero degrees and then comes down um, as I go to 90 degrees. So if I want to look at cosine, say, of a very small number, then I'm just around the peak because cosine shifted across. So it, basically the cosine of zero is one and the cosine of anything close to zero is one. So I'm just gonna forget about this cos delta x. Delta x is so small, it's practically zero. And I'm gonna call that cos delta x one. So this term here just becomes cosine of x. Now I could do the same thing with sine x and just assume that it's zero. But if I do that, I'll, I won't get anything out as the answer. I have to be a little bit more careful about how to do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom in on that point and I'm gonna assume that that is a straight line. 
So if I'm really, really close in, it looks like, you know, y equals mx plus c. And so sine of delta x is just going to be some constant times delta x. So for the moment, I'll say why, but in a, min in a minute. But uh, I'm just going to assume that sine delta x is equal to delta x. Okay, so that means it's a line at 45 degrees right up, right close to the origin. So then I get this guy here. Now this and this cancel, the delta x cancel top and bottom, and I'm left with my answer, which is minus sine of x. Okay, so that's just basically saying that as I move along this cosine, where it's at its, well, this is a sine, of course. <laughs> Perhaps I should go back and also say um, the, si the derivative of sine x by a very similar process is cosine of x. Okay, so if I look where I'm near the peak, the gradient is zero, right? It's flat, it's not increasing. And so here, the, the derivative is like the zero of cos x. Whilst if I come in here, this is the maximum value of the gradient and I treated it like it was a 45 degree line. So here the gradient is one. And so if I plotted the gradient of this, I would get cosine. And that's what we've basically shown by taking that derivative. All right, let me just talk about these pies now. Um, so this is a sleight of hand in order to actually really make this fact true. So, as you were probably originally taught it, you measure angles in degrees from zero to 360 degrees. But that 360 is the maximum was a decision made by somebody living in Sumeria who just thought it was a useful number to have as the maximum number of degrees as you go round a circle. We could have called it anything we wanted. Now, the problem with calling it um, 360 is that if I actually come and look at the gradient here, right, we know it's zero at zero and it's one at 90 degrees. So at least roughly this gradient is one divided by 90. It's really small. It's, so this isn't a, in degrees, this isn't a line at 45 degrees. It's a very, very shallow line. Um, and that's just inconvenient. So instead, what we do is we choose values for 360, which make this a 45 degree line. And it turns out that the way to do that is to make the maximum angle as you go round a circle two times pi. Okay, so to see that, look at this little bit of a circle here and think about this triangle-like thing. For a very small angle, this is almost a right-angled triangle. So then we can say that the sine of this small angle delta theta is just the opposite divided by the hypotenuse. Okay, the hypotenuse is easy. It's just the radius of the circle. That's that last divided by r. But what's the length of this arc? Well, if I went all the way round, it would be 2 pi r but I haven't gone all the way round. I've only gone delta theta out of whatever the maximum amount of theta is. So I get a fraction of two pi r as I go round, which is the fraction of delta, delta theta to the angle when I go all the way round. Okay, so we could call that 360 degrees and work in degrees, but instead I'm gonna call that two pi and now you see this 2 pi cancels that 2 pi, and this r cancels that r, and we're left with sine delta theta equals delta theta. In other words, for, for that choice of the maximum angle, calling it 2 pi, we do indeed get the idea that this function near the origin is just a straight line with a 45 degree angle. Okay, so we've done x to the n, cos x and sine x. 
Um, and there's one last guy that I want to, you to know about, which is a very strange number called, called Euler's number. So it's just a number, it goes on forever like pi, um, but the first digits are 2.718. Um, so it's defined in this way. So this is one over n factorial and n factorial is all the numbers up to n multiplied together. And then this is a sum telling me that I should add up the answer I get when I divide one by n factorial for all values of n between zero and infinity. So it's a, an infinite long sum like this. Um, and we'll get to know this function a bit better and hence to know E um, as we go along. But why is this number magical? Well, the reason is that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, right? So e, this number, 2.718, taken to a power x, has as its value the derivative. So let's have a look at that on a graph. This is what the thing looks like. So this number to the power x. So if I'm at, if x is zero, then anything to the power of zero is just one. If I start squaring, cubing, and so on, it gets bigger. If I start doing one over it to one over e or one over e squared or one over e cubed, then it gets smaller and smaller. But the magic is that if you go to one over e squared and you calculate the derivative or the gradient of that function, then the slope is exactly equal to the value of that function. Similarly, when x equals zero, so e to the zero is one, the slope is one. And then, you know, here is another example, I've gone to x equals three, and that number cubed is 20.1 and so on down the decimal places, and so is the slope. So here's another interesting function, e to the x, the derivative of it is itself. All right, so that's my very quick introduction uh, to differentiation. Um, before we get you to do some questions, um, I think uh, I'm gonna just show you a couple of examples of why this is useful in physics. Um, which hopefully will, in, will encourage you to, to, be, to show, show interest in it. So here's one example, which is um, there is a whole set of forces in nature that are called conservative forces, where they can be written in terms of a potential. So this is potential energy. So you can think of gravity, for example, is one case like this, where as you go up a hill, your potential energy changes by mgh, where h is the height, m is your mass, and g is the acceleration due to gravity. Now, in these theories, it turns out that the force a particle experiences is given by minus the derivative of the potential energy with respect to x, the, the height up. And you can just immediately see that that links to equations you already know gravitational potential energy and weight, right? Because if I do a derivative with respect to h, so that's actually h to the power one, um, then when we do the differentiation using the formula we just got, we get one h to the power zero, but anything to the power zero is just one. So this goes away, I get minus sign from here, and now you get the idea of it as you go up a hill, um, so that, you know, there's a, there's a changing potential energy, you have a weight, a force downwards. I expect you've also seen the idea of a spring that you can extend, and then there's a restoring force wanting to bring it back, which is given by minus, that means that the force is in the opposite direction to the amount that you've extended the string, and it's just proportional to the extension. So there's a spring constant K in there. Whilst the energy is a half K times the extension squared. 
And now again, you can see that if I do a derivative with respect to E here, E squared goes to two E. And so I get KE and the minus sign gives me the restoring force. So this is starting to explain to you the relationship between forces and potential energy. And it involves calculus. <clears throat> so here's also something interesting. Energy, of course, is conserved. Well, you say, of course, I say, of course, but really the reason you believe that is because we've been brainwashing you for many years. We've told you since you were probably about seven or eight, energy is conserved. And not only that, but energy can change form. It can go from kinetic energy to potential energy. Well, actually, if you think about that, that's a really peculiar idea. And it took people a long time historically to understand that that was the case by doing experiments. So it's nice to be able to understand that you can prove that this is the case. So if we now take one of these theories I was talking about with potential energy, sorry, potential energy and kinetic energy, and with that conservative force relationship, then we can actually show that this is true. So if energy is conserved, it means that it doesn't change over time. In other words, the derivative of energy with respect to time is zero. All right, I'm actually thinking I should have put in a proof of the chain rule, but anyway, uh, the way that this works, uh, well, I guess you can sort of see this actually. So look, if I want to do d by dt, I, the half and the m are just some numbers. So you want to do dv squared by dt. But what I've actually done in here, so look, remember that all these things were in the derivation was, um, was just small changes in things. So you can play games where you insert a fraction dv over dv. So that's the change in v in that, in, you know, as you go through that little bit of the process. And since I put it upstairs and downstairs, of course, really they just cancel. But now I've split it apart into these two derivatives. And similarly, I've done the same thing here by inserting a delta x, the distance it moves, the particle or whatever moves in that time delta t. The reason for this is that I can do dv squared by dv. That was example, the first example we did again. The answer is 2v, and so I get m times v times dv by dt. But what's that? Well, it's the rate of change, the, the change delta v divided by the time it changes in delta t. That is just what we mean by acceleration. Similarly, delta x over delta t, the change in the distance of particles travel, well, the change in the distance, the, the change in the position where it is, divided by the time that it took to take it there, is just the speed, v. Now, if I um, factorize out the v, I get this. But remember that we said that the force is minus dv by dx. So this is minus the force. And now we found Newton's law, F equals ma, tells us that this is zero and therefore the energy is conserved. Okay, so it's good to have a proof that that's true. And we need calculus really in order to be able to do that. Okay. Well, there you go. We're piling on the hard stuff. Uh, and we're gonna do this for the first about um, session and a half. We're gonna try and get you to really learn some stuff. And then we'll go on and we'll talk more in a more relaxed fashion about um, some harder, harder pieces of quantum mechanics later. But hopefully uh, you liked the challenge of trying to get on top of this material. So at this point, I think you should try and go to the website here um, and try and get for yourself the problem sheet which is on there and then have a look at questions one 
question two and question three. So question one is um, perhaps the one which is, mo I think there I'm just getting you to show that the derivative of sine x is cosine x. So that's encouraging you to work through that derivation that I've done an example of. Question two is about just using the x to the n form and thinking about where um, there are turning points to function. So if a function comes up and it has a maximum, so let me see what I mean by that. Um, right, so here the curve has come up, it was coming up and now it's reached a maximum and it's starting to go down again. So at that point, the gradient is zero. Um, so that's something else you can use calculus for, is to find out where these points are, where the curve is changing direction from going down to going up. And that's what question two is about. And finally, question three is a bit of a more tricky one um, for those of you who fancy a challenge. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing at this point and uh, probably I will take a breather for a few minutes, but Eleanor is around. Um, but if you want to ask us questions about any of that, you can now, or else you can have a look at those problems and maybe chat to us about them. Excuse me, can you please put uh, the link in the chat so we can uh, open it? That would be a great idea. Thank you. Um, work out how to do that, I will. Did that work? I think I've ended up putting in some gaps there that were not intended. Edit somewhere else. Okay, so maybe if you just click on that, that one will work. It does. Fantastic. <laughs> Okay, so there you can find a copy of my lectures. So if you want to look at the proofs uh, that we just went through at your own speed, you can. And then there's the problem sheet and there's three different problems there for you to think about. Oh yes, the third one now, I'm looking at it, I remember what it is now, is showing you uh, how um, some other formulas that you might know for um, potential energy might link to forceful laws that you know as well. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand where to find the, the, the question, the problem. Um, so have you gone to the chat? It is at the end, yep. yeah, probably. If, so if you, you take open the chat, the second yeah. chat. Oh, okay. Thank you. Oh, right. Okay, good. Okay. All right, Anna, I'm just going to go and grab a glass of water. So I, I shall leave. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you fully deserve it. <laughs> More than a glass of water, actually. Mm. Can you open the page, guys? Okay. 
here. So I'm trying the same. Yes, I can open it. Yeah. Second, okay. Avete già fatto a scuola la minimizzazione o massimizzazione di una funzione? Trovare minimi, massimi, punti stabili, queste cose? Io no. Ancora no? No. Ok. No, neanche noi. Come? Gaia. Eh, in... Sì, sono detto, neanche non l'abbiamo fatto. Non l'avete fatto neanche voi. Da noi dovrebbe essere il prossimo argomento. Mm, ho capito. Quindi, um, sì, probabilmente uh, la, la domanda 2 eh, in realtà, sì, tra poco appunto, quando lo farete sarà, sarà facile. Potreste provare con la domanda 1, che in realtà è il, il gemello di quello che ha fatto Nick adesso, tanto per vedere, eh, per impratichirsi con eh, queste forme di calcolo. Questa, lui ha fatto la derivata del, del coseno, potreste provare a fare la derivata del seno, che lui appunto aveva menzionato, ha messo qui, eh, ma non l'ha non l'ha calcolata in diretta. Ma il procedimento cioè, è... Il procedimento è analogo, assolutamente okay. analogo. Quindi okay. sempre quel delta x che è piccino eh, e quindi sempre usando la trigonometria, eh, quindi si può, si può assolutamente prendere eh, quello che lui ha, ha detto e, e applicarlo a questo caso. Volete provare? Quindi diciamo tutti quanti su uno. Uh, e se vi impantanate da qualche parte, se c'è qualche ostacolo, mm, vedo che Nick è tornato, poi uh, ce lo potete chiedere. Uh, sulla pagina, lasciate, dunque, dove era la finita la pagina qua? Sulla pagina di Nick uh, ci sono anche le slide. Quindi se c'è qualcosa uh, um, sulla lecture one. Sto vedendo a che pagina ci metto un po' a caricarlo ora. Eccolo qui, a pagina 6 uh, della lecture 1 che trovate sulla web page, uh, c'è la derivata del coseno e seguendo gli stessi passi si può fare per il seno. I limiti li avete fatti tutti, vero? E anche le funzioni trigonometriche? No, eh, no. in realtà no, noi no. In terza no. Neanche noi in terza non avete fatto uh, le funzioni trigonometriche, nel senso coseno di alfa più beta, non l'avete fatto? No, Se il coseno no. tri trigonometrico si fa in quarto e analisi di funzione al quinto, quindi chi ha il terzo è proprio asciutto per ora. Chi ha il terzo no. non ce l'ha, quindi... E noi abbiamo solo, cioè, fondamentalmente introdotto, cioè utilizzato il seno coseno in fisica, ma per i primi problemi, come il, le componenti vettoriali e cose del genere. Però funzioni trigonometriche, mm. cioè proprio in, in matematica, non le abbiamo fatte. 
e neanche okay. i limiti. Ho oh, capito. E neanche i limiti, quindi? No. Ho oh, capito. Neanche i limiti. Va bene. Allora, la regola di trigonometria qui, che poi se aprite uh, la prima uh, lecture 1, pagina 6, dove viene fatta la derivata del coseno, questo si basa, giocandosi sulle differenze, uh, tra eh, x più delta x, che è questa mh, piccola frazione, eh, chiamiamola così, di spazio, di variabile che viene aggiunta, mh, la regola è che il coseno, ragionando in termini di angoli, il coseno di alfa più beta, eh, o di teta 1 più teta 2, chiamatelo come volete, è il coseno del primo angolo moltiplicato il coseno del secondo angolo, meno il seno del primo angolo moltiplicato il seno del secondo angolo. Quindi mh, coseno di alfa più beta è coseno di alfa per coseno di beta meno seno di alfa per seno di beta. Al posto di alfa e beta ora avete x e delta x. E eh, diciamo mentre... che... Scusi. Come? Mentre per seno di alfa più seno di beta è la stessa cosa solo che si invertono? Adesso, per il seno di alfa più seno di beta è il seno di alfa moltiplicato il coseno di beta più il seno di beta moltiplicato il coseno di alfa. Quindi è diverso. Quindi è seno del primo angolo moltiplicato il coseno del secondo angolo più uh, la stessa cosa ma scambiando gli angoli. So Eleanor, I, I just stuck into the chat a link to a web page where there's a diagrammatic proof of those trigonometric identities. So if anybody fancies oh, yes. that, they, they <laughs> can have a look at that link. Comunque il ragionamento si deve fare con il delta x che tende a zero, giusto? Quindi il, il seno, cioè tipo il seno di delta x eh, deve avere il valore del seno di zero, per esempio. È quello che diceva eh, Nick è che il seno di delta x viene approssimato con delta x, quindi è ovvio che se delta x è piccolo, il seno di delta x è piccolo, però ehm, eh, il, eh, come vedete qua, eh, dove siamo qua? Eh, come vedete eh, sempre pagina 6 mi sembra che siamo, un attimo solo che la riapro, eh, Andiamo a pagina 6. 
Quindi, eccoci qua. Qui avete che la derivata di questo coseno è data in termini di una differenza tra il coseno di x più di x e il coseno di x e per quanto riguarda quando la funzione, quando la trigonometria viene usata per scrivere esplicitamente questo coseno, c'è un seno di delta x che viene approssimato come delta x stesso. Scusi, non Quindi, penso sia condividendo lo schermo. Che cosa? Uh, mi sa che non sta condividendo lo, stem, lo schermo. Strano perché ce l'ha scritto. Share. Ok. Sta arrivando? È arrivato? Sì, sì. Sì, ok, ecco, quindi qua nella derivata del coseno, la derivata del coseno viene pensata come una differenza, eh, differenza tra il coseno eh, nel punto iniziale più l'incremento delta x e il coseno del punto iniziale diviso per l'incremento, incremento di angolo in questo caso. E quindi una volta che eh, la trigonometria viene applicata e il coseno viene scritto in forma esplicita, questo dà il coseno del primo angolo per il coseno del secondo meno il seno del primo angolo e il seno del secondo. Se ci fosse stato un meno in mezzo, x meno delta x, da, dal segno meno avremmo avuto un segno più. Ma visto che l'incremento è pensato essere positivo, eh, dobbiamo mettere un segno meno qua. Ora, gli sottraiamo i, eh, il coseno di x, cioè il coseno al suo valore iniziale, dividiamo per l'incremento. Ah, ora, alla riga 3, cioè abbiamo un coseno di x, il coseno di delta x, siccome delta x è piccolo, tende a 0, lo approssimiamo lui con 1 perché è grosso, quindi lo approssimiamo con il massimo che può assumere, che è proprio il valore 1, mentre quando andiamo all'altro termine, che è meno il seno di x per il seno di delta x, questo seno di delta x viene approssimato col suo angolo delta x, cioè piccolino delta x e piccolino il seno, de eh, seno dell'angolo. A tutto questo sottraiamo il coseno e dividiamo per delta x. Quindi i coseni se ne vanno e quello che resta è meno seno di x. Perché i due incrementi al numeratore e al denominatore eh, si cancellano. Ora, questo è... Questo vale per la, diciamo, la variazione del coseno nell'angolo. Ora bisogna farla invece per il seno, quindi bisogna seguire la stessa procedura e farla in termini del seno. Siete pronti? Quindi va scritto... Come? Io sì, sì, sono pronto. Ok, quindi il limite per questo incremento che va a zero del seno di x più delta x meno il seno di x diviso l'incremento delta x. Usando le regole di trigonometria che uh, Nick ha messo in... Uh, um, le ha messe nella chat... vedo di recuperarle ok La vedete le regole di trigonometria messe in chat? Cioè il seno di alfa più beta. Riuscite ad aprirlo? Sì. Ok. 
quindi seno di alfa più beta, seno alfa cos beta più cos alfa sen beta. Ora, partendo da lì e seguendo questo procedimento, dovreste arrivare al risultato, risultato che è dato qua a destra. Avete una lavagna eh, su Zoom che volendo si può aprire per condividere eh, anche il risultato una volta trovato. Invece, scusi, per la seconda richiesta, per distinguere il minimo dal massimo, dobbiamo fare l'analisi del segno della funzione, della derivata prima, giusto? Sì. Ok, va bene. Sei sulla Q2? Sì, sì. Ok. Qualcuno mi vuol dire com'è eh, che funziona questa derivata del seno? Cioè, cosa dovrei mettere qua al posto della seconda riga che abbiamo qua? Che cosa ci dovrei mettere per il seno? Uh, al posto della seconda riga uh, io ho messo uh, seno di x coseno di delta x sì. più coseno di x seno di delta x Perfetto. meno seno di x. Perfetto. E quindi, quindi alla fine cosa dà? Quindi il coseno di delta x è 1, quindi rimane seno di x più sì. coseno di delta x, no, coseno di x del, per delta x. Esatto. Seno di delta x è uguale a delta x. Sì. Meno seno di x, quindi uh -huh. seno di x si annulla, delta x si annulla, rimane solo coseno di x. Perfetto. Siete tutti d'accordo con questo? Il risultato ce l'avevamo, ma uh, la derivazione è così è giusta. Quindi abbiamo usato la trigonometria e abbiamo usato questa approssimazione dove il coseno di delta x è 1 e il seno di delta x viene approssimato con delta x. Ok, molto bene. E... Vogliamo provare a fare la seconda domanda come um... So Elena, I wonder if we should go on with the next section. Oh yes, probably yes. Then I uh, will uh, yes. Yeah, and just to say to everyone, you know, which kind of setting you a challenge here which which can take you a month or more to try and understand these ideas and get on top of the problems. So uh, if if you haven't finished all the problems at this point, don't worry in the slightest, that, that's not the point. Um, we're trying to, you know, give you the tools so that in a sense you can also form small groups and, and, and learn this stuff. In fact, you know, the life of the theoretical physicist is that you go and you listen to a talk and you don't quite understand what it was about, but it sounded interesting. And then you spend a long time puzzling and uh, eventually you work it out. So um, welcome to the club. <laughs>
Right. Um, I stopped well, sharing, right? So now yeah, I'm... Uh, I will take over that. Yes, uh, it's multi-hands. Yes, okay. There we go. Uh, I hope not to interfere anymore. Uh, like, uh, okay, I think uh, my video is out. Yes. Very good. Okay, so um, the next thing I want to talk about, which I think is a really important idea, is using... Um, derivatives to, in a sense, define what you mean by a line. So to take you through that, so this is the idea of a Taylor expansion. But to take you through that, I'm going to think about all of the lines that go through the origin. And obviously, there's an infinite number of lines that can go through the origin. You can draw anything you want, as long as it goes through this point. But let's start trying to classify those lines. So what I've drawn here are straight lines. They all have the formula y equals mx. Okay, so normally a straight line is y equals mx plus c, but because I want them to go through the origin, that fixes c to be zero. But nevertheless, there's an infinite number of these where I can pick any numbers I want for m. Now, What's really the difference? Well, m is the gradient, right? It's the slope of these lines. In other words, this is what you get as the first derivative. If I do dy by dx, x, the derivative of x is one, and therefore I end up with m. So these guys are classified by the value of dy by dx. All right, let's think about some slightly more complicated curves. Here, are some curves. They again, they all go through zero, but they're quadratic form. So they look like y equals mx plus cx squared. And here I've just plotted ones which all have the same value of m. So now down here, right in close, if you zoom in, all of these curves look like the same straight line going through the origin. Except if you come out a little bit in that zoom, you start to see they have some curvature and that curvature is different and is determined by this parameter C. Okay, so if I take a derivative on this, I get M plus two C times X. If I then take a second derivative, I differentiate again, the M disappears and I'm left with just two times c. So this c, the second derivative, is classifying how these set of quadratic equations that have the same m and all go through zero differ from each other. So hopefully you're starting to see that every time I put in some derivatives, I can choose their values and I get a new curve. So, you know, we saw that you could change the first derivative, df by dx, the second one, d2f by dx squared, if you like, and a third one we could imagine changing as well. So this is the idea of a Taylor expansion. I can write any function that goes through x, a particular point x, by its value at zero. Okay, so here what I'm doing is I'm, I'm, I'm thinking basically about just the region to begin with around this point zero. So at any x, just a little bit away either side, it's a pretty good estimate just to say it's equal to the value at zero. But then if I want to do a little bit better, I can say, well, no, the, you know, I can treat it as though it's a straight line. And then I need to know its first derivative at zero so that I'm then sort of moving along one of these guys to find out how the function has changed. And then you can keep going. There's an infinite number of terms here with higher and higher derivatives evaluated at the origin times x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, x to the n. And you can think of this as me fitting a polynomial to whatever curve you drew and truncating it 
at some x to the fifth or x to the sixth and working out what all of those numbers should be. And they all relate in this way to the derivative. So let me just check this functional form because you may be going, well, where on earth does this half come from? Where's this one over n, n factorial come from? Well, so let me just, first of all, evaluate this and assume that I'm going to sit at x equals zero. That's just f of zero. But then all of these terms where x is zero just vanish, right? x, x squared, zero and zero squared, they're all just zero. And so I just get f of zero equals zero, equals f of zero, which is the right answer. Okay, now I can ask, do I get the derivative of this correct at the origin? So I take a derivative and then I evaluate at x equals zero. This is a constant, it vanishes. This, the derivative of x is one. So I get f primed at zero. The derivative of two x, sorry, of x squared is two x. So then that vanishes. And so do the derivatives of all of these higher terms. So if I look at f primed of zero, I just pick up this f primed of zero on the right hand side and it makes sense. If I do n derivatives on this function, then each time I do a derivative on one of these, I bring down a factor of n, and then this becomes n minus one. So the next time I bring down an n minus one, and so on. And the only terms that survive are precisely the one with the correct derivative, f der uh, with n derivatives on it, evaluated at zero. And the higher guys vanish, and the lower guys vanish because they differentiate to zero. Okay, so this is a way in which you can think of how to define functions going through a point. Now, normally what people do is to treat this as an approximation. You say, well, you know, let me just stop at x squared. That means I'm dropping all of these terms at x cubed, x to the fourth, and so on. But that's okay as long as x is quite small. If I would just work in a patch around here, so that the change in x, you know, the value of x away from zero is small, then powers it, high powers it, you know, the tenth power or whatever are very, very small numbers. And I get a good approximation to the function using this approximation. On the other hand, in principle, if you know all the derivatives, all of the infinite number of derivatives, this is actually a way of defining the function exactly. Okay, so I did it here for taking as my initial point, the origin and looking at small changes X away from the origin. You can also, um, start at any point x0, you know, x equals one or x equals two as your starting point. And then what you want to do is to calculate all the derivatives at that point. And now the thing that comes in is the distance that you move away from that point. In other words, if you go to some point x, you ask, how far am I away from x0, this point where I've defined the function, and that then is how the Taylor expansion works. So this is just a shift where I've shifted the origin to x zero, basically. Okay, um, so again, I'm gonna do some examples with you um, and show you some things that you kind of already know. So let me think about using this general form for the position of a particle as a function of time. So now I'm going to treat x not as a position, but as time. So I just relabel the x-axis on my graph to be t. So these all become t's. And these derivatives were d by dx's, but now they're d by dt's. And I'm just going to call f I'm going to make the thing that I'm evaluating on the y-axis the position s. So I rewrite all of my f's as being s's. Okay, so um, 
So I, I get the position as a function of the time t is the position at time zero. Plus, okay, this is the, this dot means the first derivative with respect to time. Times t plus a half the second derivative times t squared and so on. Now I'm trying to get this into something that you recognize, I hope. So normally we say that the position of a particle, we, we normally set this to be zero. So at time zero, we set it to be at the origin. So you can drop S zero because it's just zero. Now, this is the change in the position delta S divided by the time it takes to change it delta T. But that's nothing other than the speed. So that's the speed when it was at the time T equals zero, the original speed, which people sometimes call U. And what about this guy here? This is the second derivative. So it's like, how does speed change with time? Well, that's just acceleration. So what this is actually writing is a formula you've probably seen, s equals ut plus a half at squared, describing um, motion under constant acceleration. Now, if you assume that acceleration is constant, that means that a derivative of acceleration is zero because the acceleration doesn't change. And that's why all these higher order terms in the expansion, you can just drop. On the other hand, if you wanted to describe a particle that had, an, had only a constant change of acceleration, you would have to change this formula and add in plus a sixth a well, whatever that rate of change of the acceleration was, times t cubed and so on. So this is a way of, of, of generalizing this formula that probably you've already seen. All right, and then this is quite a fun one, which is um, to ask the question, why do we keep telling you about sine and cosine waves? And the reason is that they are very common in nature uh, for the following reason. Imagine I have some particle that is constrained by living in this potential. So you can think of this as just being the shape of a hill, and then there's a ball that's rolling around in it. Then it's I'm plotting the gravitational potential. And of course, what will happen is that the ball, over time, it'll roll around for a while, but it'll end up just sat there when friction removes all of its energy, it will go down to the minimum of the potential. Now, if I go in and I nudge that ball just a little bit, it'll start oscillating about at the bottom of that potential. So let's work out what that motion looks like. So here I've written down the Taylor expansion. I've done it a bit, a bit more in detail. So it's, it's the that so the value of V here. So I'm going to call this point X zero. So the value as the potential around this point is the value at the minimum plus the gradient times the distance that I go. So this is, if I, if I truncated with just these first two terms, I would be approximating this by a straight line. And then I've allowed there to be the second term so that there can be some change in the gradient as I go left and right. That's the second term in the Taylor expansion. Now, actually, um, this isn't quite right because if I wanted to uh, get, zoom in on the potential here, right at the minimum and look at it, it would just be a straight line going left, right, right? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be, have any slope at all. So that's telling us that this first derivative is zero at the minimum, right? So if I draw a line that's a tangent to this, its gradient is zero, it's just flat. So actually our potential looks like this. I miss out that term because it's zero. And now last time in the last segment, I told you that the force was given by, by minus dvx by dx. So now I can take a derivative on this. This is a constant. It's just the value of the potential at the minimum. 
So that vanishes, its derivative is zero. This here, because it's evaluated, this is all just a number. It's this delta x squared that I'm taking a derivative with respect to. And I get two, taking out the half, this number times delta x. OK, you may recognize this as being of the form of simple harmonic motion. So let me just massage it to something you might have seen. So if the force is given by minus something times the distance you are from the equilibrium point, that's the classic example for simple harmonic motion. It means as you take something away from the, from the uh, minimum point, the force gets bigger and bigger wanting to take it back the further away it gets. OK, so if I now say F equals MA, and remember the acceleration is the second derivative with respect to time of x, then I get this formula. This is just this second derivative of x with respect to x of the potential. And now this looks like delta x is minus omega squared. Delta x double derivative with respect to time is minus omega squared times delta x, where omega squared is this. And given we know how to take time derivatives, I can now give you the solution. And if I do a time derivative on this thing, well, a little bit of work maybe is needed there. But what happens is the sine goes from sine to cos. And then when I second derivative, it goes back to minus sine. And so I actually end up satisfying this equation. The point is that a sign has suddenly appeared in the solution describing the oscillatory motion of this particle. And I've shown you here that any particle sat in any hill, provided it has small enough motions about the, the bottom of the valley there, you will see sine and cosine waves emerge as the solution for the motion. OK, so that was the next little segment. And there are some questions that link to this. I think they are four, five, and six. And they encourage you to think about the um, Taylor expansion of sine x, of cosine x, and e to the x. And then it makes some relationships between those. It shows you, again, another way in which you can see that the derivative of sine x is cosine x, and so on. Um, and also you can use from that a Taylor expansion, you can see that e to the x, its derivative is the same as itself. So I think we should take another break at that point um, for 20 minutes, maybe, and you can have a look at those questions or you can keep going on the first questions if you if you prefer to get the basics in place. And as ever, just throw questions at us if uh, if you have any. Yes, exactly. Do you have questions up to now? It's a terrifying thing, but one of the things is you've got to be not scared to ask questions because that's how you learn. All right. Well, they were asking you at least, Eleanor. So perhaps it's better in Italian. Avete qualche domanda per il momento? Non propriamente. Eh, io non ho capito cos'è la, la Taylor Expansion. Allora, la Taylor Expansion, in realtà tutta la fisica, quella che si calcola, eh, è fatta, si basa su questa Taylor Expansion, quindi è qualcosa, di, eh, è qualcosa di abbastanza fondamentale come calcolo matematico. È, è un, quindi uh, vediamo se riesco a ritornare sul, sulle note, un attimo solo. Mi levo da qui. Eccoci qua. Mm. 
datemi il tempo di caricare che qui sembrerebbe che ci metta un po'. Le avete le note a disposizione, vero? Aspettate che le cerco di condividerle di nuovo appena me le carica. Ok, ci sono quasi. Ok. Cerco di condividerlo di nuovo. Fatemi fare questo. È arrivato? È arrivato? Sì. Ok. Ok, allora, um, andiamo sul potenziale che era dopo. Ok, eccoci qua. Eccoci qua. Allora, qui abbiamo un potenziale e questo potenziale, immaginate sull'asse delle ascisse c'è cioè x e sulle ordinate c'è cioè questo potenziale. Ora, immaginate di avere quindi una particella, una biglia che rotola lungo questo potenziale. All'equilibrio, nella posizione di equilibrio, uh, questa particella si troverà, questa è una piccola buca di potenziale, si troverà a eh, sedersi, diciamo, in questa, in questa conca. Appena la spostate dall'equilibrio, salirà sulla pendenza per poi quindi riscivolare. Immagino che il cursore... Si vede il cursore? O, o non proprio? Sì, sì. Ah, si vede, quindi proietta tutto. Va bene. Quindi questo, eh, sulla base di questo potenziale qui, potete pensare anche a una parabola, a un cappello messicano, fondo di una bottiglia con un massimo relativo e due minimi. Qui in realtà questo primo non è proprio un minimo, sembra più, eh, non definisce proprio una piccola conca, ma concentriamoci su questo qui, per esempio. Quindi questo è il punto di minimo. Se spostate la particella che, che dà l'equilibrio, quindi se spostate la particella o la biglia da qui, andrà su, a destra o a sinistra, per poi ricadere e oscillare eh, qua dentro. Ora, eh, questo è il potenziale. L'espansione di Taylor significa sviluppare eh, questo, espandere, questo potenziale intorno al minimo. Cioè, fissiamo x con 0, in questa espressione qui, è proprio il... Uh, il potenziale nel, al suo punto di minimo, ok? Quindi l'espansione le, è il potenziale totale, funzione di x, è il potenziale al minimo più una serie di altri termini di espansione qua intorno. È chiaro cosa stiamo facendo? Quindi si parte da il potenziale in questo punto e qui c'è la, la, de, la derivata in x0 eh, moltiplicata per un incremento o uno shift, uno spostamento intorno al punto di minimo, poi si passa al termine successivo che ha un determinato fattore 1 su 2 fattoriale che è 1 su 2 per la derivata seconda calcolata sempre rispetto al punto in cui, che si prende come riferimento, quindi questo x con 0, moltiplicata per l'incremento alla seconda, il terzo termine sarebbe 1 su 3 fattoriale per la derivata terza di questo potenziale eh, per l'incremento delta x alla terza. Ok? Supponiamo che... Eh, diciamo questo sia un punto di minimo stabile, quale sarebbe questo termine qua? 
Zero. Esatto, perché è un punto stabile, quindi questa derivata sarebbe zero. Quindi questo termine non ci sarebbe, si salterebbe subito al secondo. Eh, il secondo è diverso da zero e quindi la dipendenza sarebbe un qualcosa uh, più un coefficiente moltiplicato per un incremento alla seconda, quindi un comportamento tipo parabola qui nei dintorni. Quindi quello che si fa è approssimare questo potenziale nell'intorno di punti particolarmente rilevanti e lo si fa eh, attraverso l'uso di queste derivate. Ok. Quindi questa è la slide dopo, selezionando questo x0 come punto di minimo, come dicevate la derivata prima è 0 e i primi termini che sono quelli più importanti, gli altri se eh, diciamo eh, se la serie è convergente tutti questi termini alla fine eh, saranno sempre a mano a mano via via sempre più piccoli. Quindi limitandoci, a, eh, limitandoci ai primi due termini eh, e avendo definito quindi avendo definito la forza che è meno la derivata del potenziale rispetto a x, eh, praticamente questo eh, eh, da, eh, seleziona eh, questo diciamo, primo termine, mh? seleziona il primo termine della, de, della vostra eh, espansione in serie. Eh, grazie. O meglio, il secondo, se questo eh, eh, è comunque un, un termine eh, diverso da zero. Chiari? Quindi se come, volessimo, se come nella consegna volessimo sviluppare seno coseno, continueremo a trovare seno coseno meno seno meno coseno e così via. Esatto, tutti quanti vanno calcolati. Uh, nel punto, uh, nel punto di riferimento, in questo caso uh, zero, e, e, e da questo si ha, la, uh, diciamo, prendendo come riferimento lo zero, nel caso specifico dell'esercizio, uh, si può trovare, si trova la Taylor Expansion uh, del, del seno, del coseno, di E alla X, eccetera. Va bene? Volete provare a fare il primo esercizio che è il 4? Questo primo esercizio del Q4 fatto sul seno fa vedere anche perché precedentemente avevamo detto che il seno di delta x veniva approssimato con delta x. E fatto sul coseno fa vedere perché in prima approssimazione il coseno di un angolo molto piccolo si approssima direttamente uh, a 1. Proviamo a fare quindi magari il 4 sul seno, così uh, vediamo come viene fuori che il seno di un angolo molto piccolo si approssima direttamente con il valore del suo angolo.
ma se qualcuno ha fatto ce lo dice a tutti quanti. Rimetto sulla pagina, che è, mettiamo quella generale. Mettiamo, ecco, questa qua. Io credo di averlo fatto, però non so se è giusto. Okay. C'è qualcun altro che l'ha fatto? Proviamo già a dirlo oppure aspettiamo un altro minuto? Aspettiamo un altro minuto? Ok, un altro minuto. Hai 37. Ok, 37, via. Allora. Questo è il seno? Sì. Ok. Quindi f di x è seno, quindi f di 0 è 0. Ok, ci siamo. La derivata prima, f primo di x è coseno, quindi okay. f primo di 0 è 1. Giusto. Poi derivata seconda meno seno, quindi okay. f secondo di 0 è 0. Sì. Derivata terza meno coseno, quindi f terzo di 0 è meno 1. Ok, ci siamo. Quindi f di x dovrebbe essere 0, perché il valore della funzione è 0, sì. più 1 per x, quindi x. Esatto. Più 0 fratto 2 per x quadro, quindi sempre 0. Giusto. Meno un sesto x alla terza. Meno un sesto x alla terza. Meno un 3 fattoriale sarebbe, quindi meno un sesto sì, x sì. alla terza. Quindi è giusto. Quindi si vede che il primo termine della serie è x. Eh, x alla terza diviso 3 fattoriale è più piccino se supponiamo che x sia piccolo. Quindi ci sembra che la serie converga perché tutti gli altri sono sempre più piccoli, quindi diciamo che al primo ordine il seno di un angolo piccolo si può, su, eh, si può approssimare con il suo stesso angolo, quindi con x, più termini di ordine superiore che sono x al cubo e poi ci sarà un x alla quinta eccetera eccetera. Molto bene, ok, e possiamo provare a fare la stessa cosa per il coseno, eh, usando le derivate che già sappiamo adesso quali sono e vediamo come è fatto invece il coseno. Quindi qui abbiamo dimostrato la prima approssimazione che avevamo già usato prima. Adesso facciamo un coseno, vediamo come si comporta.
Quindi il seno in realtà prende tutte le potenze dispari di questa x. Vediamo il coseno invece che cosa fa. Do you think we should do the final bit at this point, Eleanor? It's a relatively short piece, but... Um... Okay. Uh, well, we postpone the cosine to later on, and then uh, we jump back. One second that I stop sharing. Okay, I think we are back, right? Yes. Okay. I'll mute myself. Very good. So we've got some of this in English and some of it in Italian as well. So that's good. Um, the, the last thing that I should talk to you about is integration, um, which is the opposite of differentiation. It's just the inverse of the process. Um, so for example, we knew that the derivative of sine x is cos x. So that means that the integral of cos x is sine x, well, actually plus a constant. And because if I differentiate the right-hand side, the constant just vanishes. Now, you would think there was a big industry in people showing from first principles that this is true, but I'm afraid to say that nobody really knows how to do that. The only way that you can work out how to integrate something is to have differentiated something and it given you what you were interested in. So in fact, there was a long period when mathematicians used to sit in their maths buildings and differentiate things in order to construct tables. And they went on for books and books and books of, you know, basically if I differentiate this, I get this. So if they ever wanted to integrate that, they'd know what it, what it went to. Um, these days we use computer programs to do this remembering for us. There are things called Maple and Mathematica that we use day to day and you would just ask it, well, what's the integral of cos x? And it'll spit out sin x. But really it is just going to a library and looking up the answer. Um, the only way to do this is to differentiate and then sort of see, see what that gives you as the inverse process. Which isn't to say that there aren't some tricks that people use, and, and sometimes people teach these and they con students into thinking that they're first principles doing um, integration. You're not. All you're doing is massaging something messy into a form where you already know the answer um, because of differentiation, and so you can immediately leap um, to the result. So this is an example, the integral of cos x squared 2x dx yikes okay well what you do is you just dis decide to call x squared u so then you can calculate du by dx and it's 2x right because u is x squared if i differentiate it i get 2x so you can replace the 2x dx by du because du by dx is 2x Now you recognize something you know how to do. You can integrate cos u with respect to u. That's just the thing that gives you sine u plus a constant. And then you substitute back the x squared for u and lo and behold, you've got the answer. So those tricks are sometimes useful um, to put things into a form that you can, can use. There's another trick, uh, which I bring up mainly because I think I use it in one of the problems. So if you were to go back to the original definition of differentiation, and you were to put in as the thing you're differentiating the product of two functions, u and v, and you went through the proof, you would find that you get this as the answer, that you can differentiate u and then multiply by v, but you also get have to add in u times the derivative of v with respect to x. So if you wanted, you could go back and actually stick this form into the basic definition and show that this is correct. 
A fun thing you can do with this though, is you can now integrate. And you can integrate the left-hand side exactly because you know that the integral of the derivative is just the thing that you started with, so uv. So then you can say that u times v is the product, you know, is the sum of the, is the integral of these two terms. And then you can rearrange that to put this one on one side and say that the integral of this is uv minus the integral of that. And again, plus a constant, uh, which always comes up because when you differentiate a constant, you get zero. So um, this is sometimes used as a formula where you, you can't do an integral because you don't know what it is, but by recasting that product of things and calling one this and one that, you can then find that you can do these integrations. So that's called integration by parts. And as I say, I think in question three, not question three, question six, um, you would need to be able to use that to do it. Okay, the other thing that I just want to flag is that um, Newton taught us that integration in this way actually teaches us how to calculate the area under a graph. So if I, for example, take this function 7x minus 8.5x squared plus 3x cubed, which looks like this red line, and I want to know the area under this, well, one thing you can do is just to sort of do numerical approximations where you pretend that it's a bunch of rectangles. And then if you make the rectangles thinner, you get a better answer. So here's a, somebody's done that and they've, um, you know, depending on the number of rectangles, you get a better and better answer. And here it says that if you go to infinity, you'll get the answer 3.33333. The reason we know that is from integration. So the process that Newton taught us for doing this is that you integrate the function and get the answer, and then you evaluate that, as they say, between the limits. So you evaluate it here and you evaluate it here. And the difference between those two values is the area under the curve. So that's one of the reasons that we write this integration in this way, because it's kind of like we're adding up infinitesimally large numbers of infinitesimally thin rectangles. So this integral sign is designed to sort of suggest adding up to you. Um, and then the, we write it with a dx like this, because it's kind of like working out the area of this rectangle. It's the width of the rectangle is delta x times the height is given by the function. Um, so that's a, a sort of another thing that is, is the big point of integration is that you can use it to find the areas under curves. Although I don't think we're going to use that in fact um, as we go along. But I thought I should point it out to you. All right, so that is all I'm gonna formally um, teach you today. Um, of course, there's a lot more you can say about calculus, but that's sort of a minimum amount of stuff that if we can get you on top of, next time I can go forwards and I can do quantum mechanics for you, and I can actually show you the, the fundamental wave equation that underlies quantum mechanics. Um, and I think you'll find that a lot more satisfying than if I just waved my hands um, about how it all works. Question six is the last one that you can have a go at uh, of today's questions on that problem sheet. Um, it's quite a hard one, that one. It's sort of a challenge for the next month. Um, but you can have a look at it and have a think about it. Uh, we will provide you with the solutions to all of today's problems uh, before we meet next time. So hopefully you can sort of feel that you've got the main results um, under your belt by that point. And next time, I promise, we really will do quantum mechanics, uh, not mathematics. Um, and then, so the first session on quantum mechanics we're going to do, I, we're going to look at the mathematics of it. So we'll see the wave equation and so on. The second one, I'll become a bit more liberal and I'll start to just tell you about the implications of quantum mechanics um, without so much calculation. All right, I shall stop 
there for today. Uh